You know, when uh, a higher ranked officer comes into uh, the room, Justin, what are you supposed to do? Call the room to attention. You salute. It's a response. And that is the key word to, for today's sermon, response. When we got attacked at Pearl Harbor, we had a response. When we got bombed at 9-11, we had a response. And that's the key word for today is response. What is, what is, how does Webster's define the word response? An action or behavior that is done in return to another action or behavior. If you take your Bibles this morning, we're going to be back in the book of John, John chapter 7. We're going to see in this passage people's response to Jesus. How did people respond to Jesus? After he gave the invitation to believe, how did they respond? John 7, we'll begin where we left off or where we were last week and read down through verse 52. John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When the people heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others says, said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David, and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the, or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. His invitation, his invitation to thirst, his invitation to come, and his invitation to drink, it demands a response. You cannot be apathetic towards this invitation because even your apathy is a response to the invitation of Jesus. So what type of responses do we see in this passage and where do you fit into these four responses? Where do you see yourself in these four responses? Where do you see your loved ones in these four responses? And what's our responsibility then with what we see? First of all, I want you to notice this morning the response of the convinced. The response of the convinced. And we'll see this beginning in verse 40 and 41. This is very clear. We won't spend too much time here, but these people are convinced. They receive the truth. They believe the truth. When they heard these words, some of the people says, this really is is the prophet. Others says, this is the Messiah or this is the Christ. They really believed what he was saying and they really believed in who he was. They believed that he was the prophet. Now, what's this prophet talking about? Well, Moses, back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter number 18, made this prophecy and he said this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like, like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So they had been looking all this time for this prophet. That's what they said in verse 40. 
Oh, this is the prophet. This is the one that Moses had told us about. He's it. He's the one. In Acts chapter number three, Peter's preaching and he says this, Moses said the Lord God will raise for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him. You shall heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that statement or that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among his people. He's going, look, Peter's preaching saying, Jesus was the one that Moses was talking about. And here they had believed. It was familiar to them. This was the group of people that may have been, been in the upper room, the 120 of the book of Acts, when the Spirit descended. These were the true believers, the true followers of Christ. They had thirsted, they had came, and they had drank to this invitation. They had wholeheartedly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that where you're at today? Are you in this group? Are you convinced that Jesus was who he said he was? You see, if you're not in this group, if you're not firmly convinced that Christ is who he said he was, then you sit here this morning, and I say it gently yet strongly, you are without hope because you are still clinging very tightly to your own goodness and your own abilities. These people had forsaken all of that and had come to Christ. The gospel says that your goodness will keep you out of heaven. The gospel says there is none good, no, not one. The gospel says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The gospel gives the good news that Jesus has come and done all the good works for you. And he's paid your sin debt so that you don't have to go and stand at the judgment seat and plead your own case. If you haven't believed the gospel, then you cannot say that you're in this group. You can't say that you're convinced about Jesus. Maybe you're in this second group. Maybe you're in this second group. Let's look at the response of the contrary. The response of the contrary. Second part of verse 41. But some said, as opposed to what these said, that he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. Some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? They were kind of shocked. Verse 42. Has not the scripture said that Christ, the Christ was to come from the offspring of David and that he's supposed to come from Bethlehem where David was from? Do you remember back, way back in John chapter 1, well, the people are already making the same argument. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And we use that illustration about a little old town like Burnsville. Can anything good come out of Burnsville? You see, they, they really look down on Nazareth and Galilee. And Galilee and Nazareth are not two different things. Galilee's like the county, and, and Nazareth is the town inside the county. It's like Burnsville, Burnsville isn't Stanley County, isn't it? <laughs> Anson County and Burnsville is right here. Woo, that was close. <laughs> they looked down on Nazareth because Nazareth was kind of, in Galilee, that area was kind of worldly. I mean, they didn't hold too stringently to the law. So that's why they said, well, man, how, how can anything, how can the Messiah come out of a place that it's kind of worldly and doesn't even want to obey the law. How is that even possible? And they, they accurately, they don't really quote it, but they say accurately and clearly, hey, doesn't the Bible say, doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem? And that's true. Micah 5, 2, if you don't have that verse, it's in the Old Testament, try to find it now because it's in the Minor Prophets. But if you don't have that verse underlined, make note of Micah 5, 2 because it's a prophecy of where Jesus was going to be born. It goes like this, but you, Bethlehem, though you be little among the thousands of Judah to get, to, to get out of, you shall he come forth unto me that is the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. It's a prophecy that the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. And so they're right. They're accurate. So they continue to mock going, look, 
nothing good can come out of Galilee. He's got to come out of Bethlehem where David's from. Because if he's not where from David's from, he has no right to the throne. He can't access David's throne because he's not from David's line. And the New Testament makes accurate record. He came from Bethlehem. He was of the line of David. His father came from David's line. His mother came from David's line. That's laid out in, in the book of Luke. All they had to do, we've said this before, was go to the temple and check the facts. He's doing all these works. He's healing these people. I think he's from Galilee. You know, maybe I'm going to go to the temple and check where he's really from. They, they didn't do that. Why? Because it was a convenient excuse. Let me say that word again. It was a convenient excuse not to look at the facts and just say, well, we know he's from Galilee. You know what this is? This is willful ignorance. It's willful unbelief these people had. It's a smug, self-satisfied attitude. You ever heard those people, hey, don't confuse me with the facts. That was their attitude. That's unbelief at its core. Now, mark this in your mind when they said Messiah had to be born in the line of David, the city of Bethlehem. Jesus fulfilled all of that. He did everything they, they wanted. He was from Bethlehem. He was from the village. He was from David's line. And they just ignored that. They didn't take the time to go and look, to investigate. What happened? So there was a division among the people over him. You had the convinced and the contrary arguing. What does this show? These people over here, the convinced, they had really believed. The contrary hadn't believed, so friction. If I could take a little sidebar here, please know when you take a real stand for Christ or gospel truth, you know what's going to happen? <laughs> There's going to be friction. Don't be shocked by it, alarmed by it. It's going to cause some friction. It did here. But they didn't cave in. They didn't quit. They didn't roll over for fear of the Jews. They announced that, yes, we have believed. Both groups stood their ground. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He can't be. He wasn't born in Bethlehem. You know, these, this group certainly exists today. Back in Jesus' time period, we use this term, they were just looking for an excuse not to believe. Hey, let's just, let's just pick an excuse. This would have to be, well, he's from Galilee. Today, when people outright reject Jesus, lots of times they make the excuse of blaming the people that follow him. You ever heard that one? Well, I'd follow Jesus if it wasn't for all the hypocrites at church. Hey, we're flawed people. We get it. That's why we go to church. I'd go to church if it wasn't for the people, or I'd believe in Jesus if it wasn't for his followers. Maybe you've seen the, here's a big fancy word, hullabaloo on the news over what happened with the Duggars here recently. And people are just, Lamb blasting the Duggars and oh, how could that happen? And oh, you bunch of hypocrites. Hey, look, they're imperfect people who handle the situation imperfectly, but they're just looking for an excuse. It's what unbelievers do. Hey, where can I find an excuse to reject the gospel? You see, they're just making excuses so they don't have to come to Jesus because deep down, they don't want to come to Jesus because if they come to Jesus, they've got to accept what Jesus says about them. That they're imperfect, flawed, broken, can't get to God on their own, and they don't want to admit that. That group exists today. You see, this group, the contrary, is a willful rejection of Christ, despite what they might say, despite what they might show you. It's just, they're just rejecting Christ and what he says. The excuses are just a covering. Now, here's where it gets uncomfortable, maybe for us who are professing believers. Did you know that believers can slip 
into this group. Say, no, Pastor Philip, I am convinced. I have believed. You say you've believed, but what does your life say? Does your life say one thing, but with your mouth you say another thing? Yes, I believe, but with your life, it's contrary. You're living contrary to the Word of God. You're living in disobedience to the Word of God, and yet you scream loudly, yes, I'm convinced I believe, but I'm not going to listen to a thing he says. I will live my life in my way. See, by your life, you're actually rejecting Jesus, not accepting Jesus. So the first possible response to Jesus is to receive. The second possible response is to reject. That's still true today. The third group, the response of the confused, the confused. We see these in verses 45 and 46. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? Now, why would they ask that question? Well, you happen to have your Bibles back in verse 32. As Jesus was there and it was about, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about who Jesus was, muttering these about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Hey, go get him, boys. Go get him. But they go to get him, and they come back empty-handed. So they question these underlings, well, why did you not bring him to us? Well, notice their response. No one ever spoke like this man. They were, went and they heard his invitation and they were amazed, shocked at the authority and the power with which he spoke. Never has a man spoken like this man. Now, here's the kicker. These guys knew what it was to be under authority. You got a boss at work and you know, man, if you slip up, the hammer's coming. If you don't get it done, I'm in trouble. If, if I don't get this job accomplished, man, I'm getting a doctor day's pay. I'm getting written up. Whatever phrase you want to use, you know you're in trouble. So these guys knew how tough their bosses were, knew how bad the repercussions might be, and yet they still come back empty-handed. That's how amazed and in awe they were of Jesus and what he was saying. But even if we believe that, and we do believe that God was the one in charge of all of that and that no one was going to lay their hands on Jesus until it was time for that to happen, and that was still six months down the road, then that God, you know, supernaturally kept that from happening, and we do, God did a work in them to amaze them. No one, we've never heard anyone talk like this. They do the consequences. So why didn't they lie? Right? You ever gotten a pinch? And because you don't want to get in trouble, you just kind of stretch that truth a little bit. Gee. They didn't even lie. Give them credit for that. They could have said, well, boss, he slipped out before we could get to him, man. By the time we got there, he was gone, man. No, they went back and go, we never heard anybody like this. We don't know what to do. We're amazed. We're, we're confused. And in the middle of their bewilderment, their confusion, the Pharisees answer them. Have you also been deceived? And the way this is constructed in the original, it, it's, it's, they, he, they're pressing them to answer in a negative. They're playing on their pride. Oh, surely you're not stupid. You didn't, you didn't think that, did you? you didn't, you're not following the ignorant masses and believing this guy, are you? Come on. Verse 48. Have any, he, or he's asking them, has any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? Hey, look, we haven't believed in him, and we're smarter than all of those lower peasant people. So he plays to their, 
to their pride, to their arrogance, to their sense of loyalty. You're loyal to us and, and we haven't believed, so how, how could you ever believe? None of us who are really spiritual have believed, so if you're really spiritual, you won't believe either. They were confused and they were trying to draw them back in. Verse 49 reads this way in the ESV. And again, the Pharisees or these people are talking to the, the officers. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Let me read that to you out of the NL, NLT. He's saying again to the officers, this foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. They say, come on, man, get your act together. You can't really believe. You'll be deceived like all these other foolish people. Don't be disloyal. We don't know. We may see these officers in heaven. We don't really know. What we do know is they were kind of confused. They were kind of, if I can put it this way, straddling the fence. One foot in, one foot out. Man, this Jesus, man, he, I never heard anybody speak like this. Oh, but these Pharisees, they haven't believed either. And I'm not sure. I don't want to be disloyal to them. They were kind of straddling the fence, if you will. Here's the bad news. The people that are straddling the fence, those that are confused, they end up in the same place those that are contrary end up because they never really believe. They end up in eternal hell separated from God because they refuse to turn towards Christ in that invitation that he offers. Do you know someone in this group, someone in your life, maybe it's you, maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's a family member, and they've got one foot in and one foot out. Oh, they, they might tell you they really like Jesus. Jesus is a pretty good guy. Oh, yeah, I like him. He's, he's nice. He's good. I like some of the things he says. What's that sermon on the mountain? Oh, no, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Humble shall whatever, meek shall inherit the earth. Or what, yeah, yeah, I like that Jesus. No, they're just, they're just confused. They haven't really believed. They're just kind of straddling the fence. How, what's your response to that if you know someone like that? You share the gospel again and again and again and you live your life in such a way that shares with them and lets them know that they can believe it's okay Christ is real forgiveness of sins is real and they can believe finally this morning you have the compliant the compliant it's a synonym for yielding for yielding there are some people, if I can put it this way, that are just in the process. They're not quite there yet. The convinced, we talked about earlier, they receive the truth. The contrary, reject the truth. The confused, they're kind of wrestling with the truth. But the compliant or the yielding, you know what they do? They research the truth. This group would have went to the temple records and say, hey, let me check out where he's from. Let me go and dig around and root around and see where he was really born. Because I see him doing all these miracles and all these works. Maybe he is. Let me go see if he was born in Bethlehem. Let me see if he is the line of David. They're researching. As I was thinking about, this is where I was. April 10th, April 9th, 1994. I remember sitting on my couch in my apartment in Concord, North Carolina, living by myself, just read an article in the newspaper about some crazy Russian who wanted to nuke Israel and nuke the United States of America and talk about the end coming. And, 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 and I thought the Holy Spirit spoke to me, not audibly, but to me and just says, you are not right with God. You are not good enough and you will go to hell if you die. I went to work the next morning. I don't know what compelled me to say this, but it was to my boss, my co-manager, Randy Atwell. 
And I said, boss, I said, you won't believe what happened to me. And Randy and I had never discussed spiritual things ever. I said, man, I, I'm scared about dying and going to hell. Randy says, man, I got something for you. And he's like, let me run out to the truck. And he ran out to the truck and he got a cassette tape. I know those are dead into the world now, right? Cassette tape. <laughs> he said, man, you got to listen to this. And it was a tape from the Central Church of God in Charlotte, North Carolina. Pastored, still pastored by Loran Livingston. I went home that afternoon, stuck that tape in my radio player, my cassette player, and listened to music and a message from a charismatic. Oh, not only do I have an independent Baptist background, now I got a charismatic background. We're in trouble. <laughs> but I listened to that tape. And I went back the next day and I said, Randy, do you have any more of those? He said, man, I got some more. Friends got them. Let me call them and I'll get them here. Gave me five more. Listened to them in like two or three days. You know what I was doing? I was searching. God was working, working, doing a work in my life and my heart. And it wasn't until about seven, eight, nine days later that I sat on that church pew right about where Gary Hamilton was sitting. And the pastor gave the, 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 the invitation to come and believe in Christ. And I came. I was the compliant. I was yielding. What do we see here? Not just my illustration. What do we see here in Scripture? Nicodemus, who had gone before, who had gone to him before. Remember John chapter 3, the man that came to Jesus by night? That was Nicodemus. He had come to, he had come to Jesus and Jesus, talk to me about yourself. Hey, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus was like, whoa, that blows my mind. What are you talking about? So he spent some time with Jesus. We don't know how long that conversation went. We just have our record of it. But it had gone to him before, and who was one of them? He was a Sadducee. He was part of the religious group. He says, whoa, fellas, whoa, whoa, whoa. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Guys, we're stepping over the bounds here. I've talked to this guy. I've, I've investigated this guy, and I think we're stepping out of bounds here. Here's, here's our own law that you want to love and go by. We can't violate that, fellas. Come on now. We can't arrest him or try him yet. Nicodemus had probably done some research on Jesus. He's processed enough to know that it's not going to be right to kill him. We don't know where he is exactly in his own soul at this point, but he knows it's going to be wrong to arrest him and kill him. He's in the process. He was just trying to stop the mob. In verse 52, they, they come back at him. Oh, are you from Galilee too? Oh, you, you're not some low-life, worldly guy who's a follower, are you? Come on, Nicodemus. Hey, Nicodemus, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Well, they had forgotten about Jonah and Nahum and Hosea, all of which came from Galilee. So they had forgotten their own law. They were just kind of picking and choosing what fit for them. But Nicodemus was a man who was searching. And where do we find Nicodemus at the end of the gospel of John? John 19. After these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away the body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So where was Nicodemus when Jesus needed to be buried? He was with another believer. Many scholars believe that Nicodemus had believed by that point. So Nicodemus was searching the truth and he looked like he had come to, come to faith. He was compliant. He was yielding. Do you know someone who's, man, they're just, maybe you're, you're just right there. You've researched and you've seen people's lives and they're imperfect, but they really love Jesus and 
I mean, you just, you haven't took that last step to come to Christ. I urge you today, make that last step today. Make that last step today and come to Christ. Have your sins forgiven. Come into a right relationship with a holy God today. Maybe you've got a loved one and they're on the fence. They're just there. They're, they're, not, they're, just, they're just so close. They've investigated Jesus and, and, and they're just ready to believe. And maybe God wants to use you. Maybe God wants to use you as that last bridge. Hey, would you believe in Christ today? The Bible says that we are his hands and his feet. We are his body. Are you convinced this morning? Have you believed in the gospel? Have you believed that you have no good to offer God and that you've got to trust in Christ's goodness for your standing with God? Are you contrary this morning? Have you just outright, just flat rejected Jesus and had every excuse under the sun not to believe? Hey, would you lay your excuses aside today and believe in Christ? Maybe you're confused. Maybe you like Jesus. You've got one foot in, one foot out. You're just not quite sure. He's a pretty good guy. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God who lived and died and rose again for you that you may be made right with God. Believe that today. Maybe you're compliant. Maybe you're like me today. Maybe you're like me today back in 1994. You're just sitting there, boy, you, you're under conviction. You know you're not right with God and you're, you're just ready to believe. The fruit is ready to be plucked off the tree, if I can use that old adage. Would you come today and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's bow in prayer. As the musicians come, where are you at today? Where are your loved ones today? Where are your sons, your daughters, your aunts, your uncles, your grandchildren? Where, what group would they fall in? And how can you diligently beg God for them? Maybe you are convinced. Maybe you are settled in your faith this morning. Your life and your profession match up. Maybe you need to pray for somebody today that's in one of these other groups. Maybe you need to beg God for someone you know that's in one of these other groups. Maybe you're here today and you say you're convinced, but your life, you're struggling with a sin habit that you're struggling to overcome. Maybe you need to come today and ask for forgiveness and get some accountability with that, get some help for that. That's a great place to be, to want to acknowledge that. Great place to be. It's better than willfully rejecting help and not wanting help with your sin. Whatever your need is today, I would just want to invite you before we stand and sing, to come today. Come believe. Come get forgiveness. Whatever your need is, the Lord Jesus Christ can meet that need. Father, help those of us that are in this convinced group live a life that says we're convinced, that lets others know we're convinced. May we not live one way and say another thing, but may we be wholeheartedly convinced. And Father, for those of us that are convinced, would we, Lord, be willing to pray or go to these other groups, people that we know that are contrary or confused or even compliant. Father, we might share the good news of the gospel with someone. Father, we thank you that you've sent your son to die for us. Father, be with your people. May your word take root in hearts and lives today. May they be challenged to grow and to change. In Christ's name I pray, amen.